what is the biggest problem in India is lying at the heart of our own system also. At the same time, we have to have international pressure at the one hand, but the domestic pressure is in important. For example, uh, we have seen the rise of Monsanto paying huge amount of bribes to Indian politicians, and if somebody start digging it, they will find lots of crops behind it. This is one of the way one can move ahead. Now, so what is important here is to look how, how we can combat corruption within. Now, recent, there was a BT Brinjal, and our corrupt minister, Sarat Pawar, I mean, everybody knows about that, that lots of cases are pending, is, is a major hurdle. Because if you see about intellectual property rights, every country has to allow that. And even if you have an international, uh, you have to have in India too. So we allowed them gradually to grow. Now, now it is one of the things which politicians in India can take very easily the step to ban it. Like in many cases we have seen that if Monsanto was existing in Norway, just see the scenario, the people pressure plus the, the law, our law here could have prevented just in one day. So the basic problem is lying also directly in the hands of, in India, within the politician and the administration who's harvesting bribe on the daily and monthly basis. You know, I know certain people who have been on Monsanto uh, paid off, especially the tax officials too, apart from that. So this is one of the things which we should, apart from the gene modification and other issues, we have to focus on that. And that, if we find this, then according to Norwegian convention, I mean, one can pull back if there, there is a correct transaction of corruption. So you can have just one day to pull back all your investment. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Let's take a couple of other comments or questions. Hello, uh, my name is Pia Holmquist, I'm a Swedish filmmaker. I made the film Bullshit about uh, Vandana and, and Monsanto some years ago. And when we studied there, when we filmed, we filmed, we followed actually Vandana and Monsanto for two and a half years. And it was very clear that when we got to Monsanto, when they talked about their way of working, it was like Leonard Cohen. First we take Manhattan, then we take Berlin. <laughs> I mean, it, it was like, a, they had a very clear route how to do this. And also it's very, very clear with, when they came with, with governments, all these governments that they worked with, they became so impressed with Monsanto when they, really, when they met finally. And I got the same impression in Linda Hartland's film. That first, the Norwegians are strong, and they say, we'll go and do that. And then when they meet Monsanto, they lean backwards and say, yeah, that's really nice. <laughs> and, and I just wonder, why is it so? I mean, for God's sake, you are a fantastic country. And I got the same thing when I heard Jeanette talking here about KLP. Why in the head are you you're like making excuses for yourself all the time? And I don't think you need it. And I think it's so strange to see that a country in like Norway, why should you pick Monsanto to, to put money in? There are so thousands of companies who are making alternative economy all around the world. Why don't you put some money on them instead and we'll, we'll have another, another future than we have with, with Monsanto in our hand? Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Christopher Wiseman. I am an American, so don't hold it against me. I apologize. But I do have a question, but I'm gonna start with a little comment first. Uh, Monsanto, like all multinational corporations, are meant to make money. And Monsanto is doing a really good job doing it. But if the Norwegian government is not supposed to regulate them, if they polluted international regulatory bodies, then who is? That's my question. Thank you. Okay. Should we take one other? Should we take one other? Yeah. 
Yeah, it's me again. Uh, I won't uh, argue with the legal issues um, because I think there's important consideration to be made there. Uh, but I have a couple of questions. Uh, first of all, um, it's not like, I think you paint a very black and white picture. Uh, uh, there are international uh, measures being taken to ensure biodiversity. I'm sure you heard of the global uh, seed vault at Svalbard. Um, and second of all, um, it's not like, um, I, I'm curious as to how, how do you plan to feed a world population of 9 billion in 2050 uh, without uh, genetically modified foods? Uh, Norman Borlaug, the Nobel, uh, Nobel Prize uh, laureate of 1970, has said explicitly that GMO is needed to feed the world population. Thank you. And one other, one other comment over here. My name is Nina Lilligraven. I'm a pharmacist and, and I've been out of um, the pharmaceutical industry for some years and I'm, I still feel I need recovery from that experience. Um, I just had to address now, I have appreciated so many of um, the comments and the issues and they're very important and of course one shouldn't be afraid to raise the issue of what about feeding the hungry and feeding the needy. The problem is that there are so many myths about how to do that. And of course, whenever there is a face of a child with a big stomach and in need of clean water and, and, and food, apparently you don't want to even think of not making that uh, a most important issue. But the thing is, why do we still believe that we need the pesticides and these modified, or manipulated, which is the right word for it, I think, the seeds, to feed the hungry? There are proof and there are books and there are even projects in India shown on televisions that are disproving the fact that the crop is as good as without the pesticide if you use whole grain and do not manipulate the, the soil so that you need to do the, uh, the enrichment. The thing is in India, Monsanto and companies like them are arguing now that those projects proving that Monsanto's methods are not necessary are being, um, are being um, told um, are jeopardizing the food supply in India. And I'm just wondering how is it that we need more proof when there are projects and people who you can actually visit to see that you don't need proof. I mean, this is just an excuse. We think we need more time. We don't have more time. Hans Petter. Yes, thank you. Um, I, as a lawyer, I, I don't want to go into the debate on uh, whether uh, solving the food problems uh, by the use of GMOs uh, is the right way or not. But what I react to as a competition lawyer is uh, uh, the, the ability to uh, patent and establish uh, monopoly positions within uh, basic resources necessary for agriculture. And I think uh, that, from my point of view, is what should be combated. And, and then we could leave to, to science the question of what is sort of the best way of uh, developing our uh, agricultural methods. Um, I think when, I'll just comment some on the strategies of, uh, of the political strategies. I agree with Axel Nashta that it is basically a political strategy if one wants to uh, include uh, uh, patenting of uh, GMOs uh, as part of the exclusion policy of the uh, petroleum fund because it has to be decided by the political majority and I think it's a very different strategy if the strategy is to exclude Monsanto as a company uh, because then you have to convince the ethical uh, committee uh, and you have to use uh, quite different types of argument uh, than the arguments that are necessary in the political debate uh, and I think that uh, to convince the ethical committee as the guidelines are today that operating within the GMO field is unethical, I think is very difficult, just like it was difficult to convince them that tobacco production in itself was unethical, 